All right, this video is a little bit different than what I normally do because I normally cover gaming and especially mobile gaming. But as a YouTube content creator and as an engineer, I'm always running out of space. So we're going to try and fix that today with the John's Bow N2 NAS build. And we're going to do true NAS on top of that. So I'm going to describe the build a little bit. So make sure you hit the chapters down below. We'll go over the build. We'll go over the parts and then I'll go over how I set up true NAS in order to help me better perform in my video editing. All right, let's talk about why I went with the John's Bow N2, mainly because it was just easy and it was small and it was adorable. It was now it was hard to find the parts mainly because it uses only a mini ITX, but the case does look absolutely great. So looking down at the case, we can see here, this is kind of an overhead. We can see that the case is actually really, really small. Now just popping off the top real quick, this is where the motherboard will go and we'll show the motherboard after we uh after we populate everything but i want to show you how small of a space you have here it's not a whole lot of room to route all your cables and it's not a lot of room to to wiggle around and you're going to need a low profile cpu cooler so i bought one by noctua and that's going to run up your price a little bit more now on the back plane we do have a back plane on where you plug up all the sata drives now these say the drives do require a 90 degree angle it's actually written in their documentation that if you do not use a 90 degree angle on these connectors it will void your warranty now it does require some power and stuff like that but we'll add that when we add our power supply right over here now looking at the front of the case which i know you guys can see here i'm lifting it up on the main camera front of the case the front of the case is actually amazing this is what i like about it. it's got a USB-C. this is probably not the best angle so i apologize it's got a USB-C and it's got a USB right there on the front. And then what I like is that you can pop off this front and now it's got a tool in order to remove some of the other facings because for whatever reason they use screws that uses a hex key instead of a Phillips screw. So I'm really not a big fan of that mainly because they could have used this space right here in order to get another SSD drive maybe mounted right here. And that would have been really great. But as you guys can see, there is five drives on this case and they do connect with these hot swappable pull rubber things. Now they are, it's a little difficult to push the hard drives in, but at the end of the day, once they're in, that's all that really matters. And how often are you really going to hot swap your drives? Not that often in a mini NAS like this. And it's got five, which is perfect because I'm probably going to set up a, a RAID Z2 in my situation. And we'll go over that a little bit later. All right. Now that we have the build all done, let's just talk about some of the components I put in here. So I put in a Gigabyte uh, B550i motherboard. Now the reason I did that is I needed two dot, I need two M2 slots essentially, uh, one for an NVMe drive and one for this expansion slot that you actually see right here in order to expand my SATA drives. There's not a whole lot of choices when it comes to a mini ITX, so we had to do the best that we can do. I do have a PCI card, which I'll probably use to uh, expand to a 10 gig network, but we're going to see how well our 2.5 gig network does considering it's just me video editing. Spoiler alert, it does phenomenal. And we are editing this whole video that you're watching right now from the NAS. Let's get back to it. I put a 4650G uh, AMD processor in there with a Noctua fan. So it's low profile, has a, a ton of clearance. So she gets some good airflow. And then we do have some ECC uh, unbuffed memory in the two channels, which is about 32 gigs, which should be plenty for upwards of 100 terabytes, give or take, of doing video editing. Now, the case did end up being really nice. Like if you if you pop off the front here, you can see all those hot swappable drives. Now, they're a little tough to pull out, but I do like these uh, anti-vibration uh, way that they kind of hook them in here. It's a little nice in all honesty. Then we have our hex wrench, which once again, I'm not the biggest fan of that. Now I will probably replace the back fan. Um, it is a little noisy in my opinion. So I'll probably replace that with a knock to a fan going forward, but everything else um, fit up perfectly. So now you do want to make sure that you have a 10 gig network. So let's go ahead and talk about the build and how you load up uh, TrueNAS onto a, we're going to use true NAS scale. So let's go ahead and flip on over there. You're going to want to do one. You're going to want to get true NAS scale or you could do true NAS core. Now we won't get into the logistics of why one is better than the other, but I do like that the true NAS scale is built on a different Linux or Linux platform. 
Um, and I do like some of the features that they're coming out with. Once you have a download, you're going to need a, a program called Rufus. Uh, you can get this for free. It's going to allow you to load an ISO. All right, we've got our USB drive plugged on up. Make sure you have that USB disk. Highly suggest that you do USB 2.0 and not bigger than 16 gigabytes just to make sure it all you know goes properly in there. Uh, select your true NAS scale I, uh, ISO. And then you're just going to go ahead and start that image. It's going to ask you a bunch of questions. You can use the recommended. Hit OK. Yes, it's going to erase all the data. And then we're just going to wait for that to finish. And I'll see you on the other side. All right, next thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to get our true NAS set up. So let's go ahead and take that USB drive, slide it, slide it on in. All right, so what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to change up that boot order. Let's go ahead here. It looks like it is booting from the USB first. We want to make sure P0, which should be our SSD drive, which apparently it is not. So let's make sure that boot order. Now, I don't know how I hook those up improperly, but it is what it is. Okay, so this is going to allow us to still keep USB drives just in case we want to plug up a USB to boot from it. I like leaving that as the primary. So let's go ahead and save this and restart. All right, and then we're going to make it on into here. Don't worry about any of the failures. That should be fine. Usually it's it has to do with like Bluetooth and a bunch of other things that may not work, which is fine. So let's go ahead and do one. We're going to install. Hit OK. And then what we're going to do is we're going to install it to that Kingston hard drive. Now we want to keep our NVMe for our cache drive. And we want to keep all of our other drives that are 14 to 15 terabytes essentially for our RAID array. So let's go ahead and select this one. There we go. Hit the space bar to select and then go ahead and hit enter. Now you could do two SSDs for redundancy, but we'll probably back up the config to the USB drive once we're done with the ISO. And it's really relatively easy to back up the config. It's kind of overkill to even have 500 gigs of an SSD, but they're super dirt cheap to the point that it is what it is. All right, cool. Now that we have our true NAS set up, there's a couple things we want to do before we make a pool in the data set and all that goodness. We want to go into our network. Now, I personally like to statically set my network. So what you're going to do is disable that DHA, uh, DHCP and go ahead and change that. The reason you do that is when in, if you go to map a drive and for whatever reason, your network decides to give away the lease and change the IP of your NAS, you're going to always have to re-add that drive. If it's always the same IP, it's going to make your life a lot easier. So go ahead and add that in there. You're going to need to know your uh, network. If you don't know how to do that, don't worry about it. Everything else can stay the same. We can think about doing some encryption, some HTTPS a little bit later and use a couple um, uh, uh, Docker applications in order to protect it. But as of right now, we don't need to do that. So let's go into storage. Now we're gonna go ahead and create pool. Now you can see I have those 14.5 terabytes. I guess we lose a terabyte and a half. That's okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add these over and we're gonna make a VDEV. Now, the reason why uh, the reason why I went with five drives is I wanted to do a RAID Z2. So RAID Z2 essentially means that I can lose two drives if, if, and still have all my data. Now, when you re-silver or re-sliver or whatever it's called, when you, essentially when you recover from parity, if one of those drives, if you're on RAID Z1 and that drive, another drive goes bad while it's trying to repopulate and rebuild, you essentially are going to lose all your data. Now, this is not a form of backup. This is just a form of resiliency. So don't treat this as a per se backup. It's just going to give you better uptime. Now, what you should do is you should create another ZFS pull on another server. And that's that's probably another commitment where you essentially mirror all this data over there and do better compression. We'll do that in another video because I already have that on my storage server. It just needs a little bit more space to accommodate this one. So we're going to do a RAID Z2. Now, you could do a mirror and you can do a bunch of different things. Now, mirrors are going to give you better IOPS, uh, but it's kind of awkward with five drives. Now, I could do four drives and I could do a hot spare and stuff like that. But considering I'm the only editor on this and I'm really not going to saturate the read and writes, and I don't care too much about writes. I only really care about reads. It's not going to matter being RAID Z2 for a video editor. Now, you're going to, if you have like two or three or four or five video editors there, then you're going to want to rethink about how you do this pool. Maybe do multiple RAID Zs with some more hard drives, where at that point, this case isn't going to be good for you. And then you mirror that or stripe that across. Uh, so there's many different configurations. It gets a little confusing. So we're going to go ahead and do that. We're going to give this pool name Jedi 1. 
I always like putting ones there just in case I make another pull. But once again, I would have to use a, a SAS extender to make that happen. That's totally fine. All right. So you can add encryption to this. And what, what I suggest is that it really, you should do it almost no matter what. But considering I'm storing mainly just video files, I'm not going to be putting any of my other critical information here. None of my SSNs or anything like that or any of my backup data that goes to a different vault. We're just going to leave it unencrypted because I don't care who has my video files because they're just raw video files of playing video games. But you should think about adding encryption if you want to. So let's go ahead and create the first uh, pool. I think I did that wrong. So what we're going to do is we're going to add this to the pool. We're going to add this to the existing pool, Jedi 1. And then we're going to change this to a cache style uh, uh, L2 arc cache, which is essentially is going to optimize a little bit more of our read speeds, hopefully allowing us to pull more data as we're editing since I am a video editor. We're going to add that into the cache VDEV and we're going to go ahead and add that v VDEV in. Now what we're going to want to do is create a data set. So if we go over there to data sets, we can create a new one. This one, I'm going to call it Curios. We're call it Curios Media. Where all my videos video footage is stored. Now, every one of these other options, you can leave the same. Now, the only one you may need to worry about is compression level. Now on video files, you're really not going to get great compression. And I wouldn't worry about all these different types of compression sets. So either you would turn it off for my purposes, or you could just inherit LZ4. It may give you slight, very slight savings. Who knows? But it's very lightweight and it doesn't really tax your system that much anyways. Let's go ahead and save that. Whew. All right, we're almost there and we're almost to testing. So a couple other things on these, this gotcha I should point out. One, we've already created a user, right? We made that Curios user. And then you want to make sure that that home directory is non-existent. And everything else, you can pretty much keep the same. But I did make a group called Editors. Now, if you go to... Uh, if you go to... If you go to local groups here, you can see I made a group called editors, and this is just really to organize it just in case I ever have more editors, which it's, it's just me, so it's fine. But this is going to matter when you go to shares. Now, I set up my data sets a little bit more uh, advanced than I should, or you know what, maybe maybe this is the way it is. I'll probably make subfolders from Windows, which won't be reported here. But what I wanted to do is keep my editing and my media separate. So in order to do that, there's a couple of things we have to do real quick is one, when you go to the shares, you want to make sure that you add a share and it's as easy as adding a share in the mount path. You can't do the, you, I mean, you could do the default mount, but it's a little tricky. So you, you're going to do the nested. Now I could have nested both of these, but for simplicity's sake and for a reason, I will show you why I didn't do that. Now, what you're going to do is go to edit ACL. Now, a couple of things that you may want to do here is one, you're going to want to add a new item here. And you're going to want to change that to who I am to group. Now that group can be editors, which I already have on this list here. So I'm going to go ahead and remove that. But if you see that group here is I have that group editors. It has read, it is write, and it has default permissions. Now there's one thing you do want to do. You want to do hit this apply recursively. Now it is going to say, hey, this mess might mess up your things. But as long as you didn't change anything else besides your group, you should be fine. You're going to go ahead and confirm that. And then you're going to apply it to child data sets. What that's going to allow you to do is if you made additional folder structures as data sets, it's going to allow you to get the permissions you need in order to do it. So once you do that, you're going to want to go to the other share and do the same thing. You may only have one share, so it's fine. All right. So on Windows, it's pretty easy. What you're going to do is you're just going to add a map drive. You're going to select any folder you want, and then you'll browse for that drive. I've already, I've already uh, configured both of them. So I have my media storage, which you can see all these different uh, folders right here. And then I do have my editing storage right here as well. Now let's go ahead and just test out some media and see how fast our 2.5 gigabyte is going, which brings me to a good point. Our one gig saturation that we talked about before, you may need to go up to 10 gig depending on your editing, but I use uh, the Flex XG Unify, which is a 10 gig uh, switch, which is all the way behind me. I know that's kind of hard to see. I'll probably flash it on screen, but it's gonna allow me to get that saturation of 2.5 as you can see here here's my link state 2500 megabytes which gives me roughly 250 megabytes of write speed depending on the type you do but i digress so let's go ahead and we'll just go here let's go to blue protocol where i've already downloaded some content let's go ahead and just copy some content over here uh this is my local storage which is not the way i want to be doing anymore i want to be 
holding it on the server. Let's go ahead and drag a file. This is a 15 minute file. And man, that is moving. That is moving sweet. Now it can move a lot faster. Once again, if we were at 10 gigs, but I would have to get a 10 gig card on uh, both sides of my uh, interface, but it also just plays perfectly fine as well. Let's go ahead and mute that real quick, but I can skip through it. I'm getting great bandwidth and I'm getting great. Uh, it's just, it's operating perfectly. I'm being able to pull files. Now the real test is let's use, let's edit our whole video. This video you're watching right now on it. And let's see what it looks like. All right. I'll take it from here past curios. But as you guys can tell, I am loading this entire video file from the NAS many different files, many different, uh, I'm pulling all the video sources from there, video essentials, everything is coming from the NAS and I can scroll through this perfectly fine. Now, a lot of my content's at 1080p. So if you're doing 4k content, you would probably have to upgrade that Nick card like we talked about. But, um, if you're doing 1080p 2k content, you can see how all of this loads perfectly fine and not even close. Well, you essentially are going to taxing the system so let's just go to my final thoughts all right as you guys can see behind me on the stack there i've got my john's bow and two ra running i've got my switch i've got my router i've got everything working am i happy with the build i am happy with the build it is everything i wanted um could you have gotten away with a little bit cheaper doing like a synology of course you can but now i've got the power to expand it's got a six core cpu in there I want to put some Docker images on there. I could, I should probably add another SSD drive if I did that, which I could probably sneak it in there, right? You know, just kind of Velcro it to the side or something. And, um, but I like having more options and more power than having less options and less power. And it allows me to scale a little bit better and a little bit easier than buying proprietary software to like Synology's Nick card, which costs like $150. Now, overall, it didn't come out to be that much. Um, I think I was somewhere in around the, the seven to eight fifty range. And I bought an aftermarket, uh, CPU cooler, which you probably should have used the stock and a bunch of other things. And we don't count the storage in there. And once again, you can pick up those, uh, storage, those 16 terabyte drives for dirt cheap on Amazon right now, but your mileage may vary. So make sure you do test them. So hope you guys enjoyed the build. Uh, if you have any questions, hit me down below. I will be more than happy to answer them and uh, thanks so much. And hopefully maybe this helps another editor out there on uh, a solution that you should do. I'll see you out there. Take it easy. If you guys want to do like and subscribe and you're still here, I appreciate it. And fist bump from me to you.